activities of the Fed because the banking system has become global. And you could no longer regulate the U.S. money supply by simply uh, via the, the domestic Federal Reserve Bank. The Federal Reserve controls the very heart of what's happening with money because money answers everything. It's the one thing that everybody wants. And when you give a private institution a monopoly on the creation of this money, you vest total control in that institution. If you have the money, uh, you can get any law passed you want. So who do you carry, whether uh, Bill Clinton is president or uh, uh, who is senator from New Jersey? It doesn't make any difference because you write a check and you get another senator. One of the stickiest questions in this debate is this. Just who owns the Federal Reserve? The city of London set the whole thing up. The Federal Reserve Bank of New York is principally owned by five merchant banks in London, chartered by the Bank of England. Perhaps England, which many have considered a political satellite of the United States in recent years, is really the one pulling the strings of international policy. It's not a matter of who owns the Fed, it's who controls it. The government has given the banks a monopoly, and then you see the Justice Department doing nothing about the bank mergers. A monopoly can only exist with government assistance, and they've given great assistance to the banking monopoly. Perhaps the headiest allegation made against those who run the Federal Reserve is that they are responsible for three of the biggest tragedies of the 20th century. World War I, World War II, and the Great Depression. Wars are very profitable. In fact, wars are probably the most profitable thing uh, an international banker can be involved in. So consequently, throughout the last at least 300 years of North American and European history, you see incidents of uh, international bankers backing both sides of a conflict. They've been trying to have a war in Europe since 1885. But the central banks of Europe had already bankrupted all the nations of Europe. They had no money. The only money was here in the United States. In order to get that money, they had to put a central bank over on the American people. It was sold as a way to bring stability to the American economy. Well, uh, what happens uh, just a little over a decade after the passage of the Fed? We see the biggest depression uh, of this uh, century in any case. For the 16 months prior to the crash of 29, the Federal Reserve increased the money supply by 62%. Now, what was happening back then? Much like it's happening today. People were buying and selling, pledging and borrowing, thinking the good times would never end. And then at the time of the crash, they pulled the plug on the money supply, and the people who had pledged their stocks, their bonds, their homes, their cars, everything, they pledged their savings accounts, they lost it all. Selling guns to one adversary while making loans to another is a common way these boys make their profits during war. And when profits begin sagging, people like Jacob Schiff, Max Warburg, and J.P. Morgan knew how to build them up again. Surprise, surprise, it's a documented fact that these fellows financed Trotsky and Lenin with billions in gold and credit to initiate the revolution in Russia. With Russia out of the war and America in, the conflict was extended by at least another two years. Two more glorious years. With Russia out of the war and America in, the conflict was extended by at least another two years. Two more glorious years of gun sales and wartime bank loans upon which to earn interest for many more years to come. There is no question that war is a profit-making business. Uh, after World War I, uh, Senator Gerald Nye held very famous hearings here in Washington where he dragged in some of the biggest bankers and industrialists and uh, put them on the spot and just examined profits that were made by some of these major interests. War is a profit-making business. Anybody who uh, says otherwise is a liar or a fool. They were able to manipulate us into World War I, and as a matter of fact, the war stretched out for at least another two years beyond uh, what it would have gone. Just when you think you're ahead of the game, someone changes the rules. They did this knowing, uh, with malice of forethought, to strengthen their own profits and to build their own institutions, their own banking uh, institutions. 
Many people believe that uh, virtually all of the wars of this century have been caused for uh, reasons that benefit small financial groups, those that uh, move in the sphere of influence of the Bilderberg and Trilateral Commission. For an example, the, uh, the war in the Balkans right now, who's been providing uh, Milosevic with arms and weapons, the Soviets have who has been financing uh, the Soviet Union, their uh, military uh, industrial complex, the United States has, European bankers have. So the bankers have been financing both sides of every major conflict. Conflict brings progress, but control conflict brings control progress. Every major war, every major conflict, arms sales, uh, loaning money to governments, uh, you get their people to pay you interest back into the uh, to the coffers of the bank, money that you created out of nothing. Nobel Prize specialist Milton Friedman claimed that the Federal Reserve caused the Great Depression by deliberately reducing the amount of money in circulation. Depositors all over the country were frightened about the safety of their funds and rushed to withdraw them. There were runs, there were failures of banks by the droves, and all the time the Federal Reserve System stood idly by when it had the power and the duty and the responsibility to provide the cash that would have enabled the banks to meet the insistent demands of their depositors without closing their doors. Congressman Lewis McFadden, chairman of the House Banking Committee during the crash, agreed, saying, the Great Depression was a carefully contrived occurrence by international bankers seeking to bring about a condition of despair so that they might emerge as the rulers of us all. There was a memo circulated in advance of the stock market collapse. All the big guys, or the insiders, let's say, got out of the stock market uh, during that four-year period. They all got out. They were cash-heavy when the market crashed. They were able to buy up major corporations for pennies on the dollar. Franklin Roosevelt's own son-in-law called the Depression the deliberate shearing of the public by the world money power triggered by the planned sudden shortage of call money in the New York markets. Insider Joseph Kennedy's wealth grew from four million in 1929 to over 100 million four years later. Then as now, America's press failed to tell us what was happening. These scenes of unrest in America have never been seen before. Cameramen would shoot them, but newsreels wouldn't play them. Controlling the news started early in America. Of course, the lighter side of the news continued to get lots of play. Fortunately, populists from President Andrew Jackson to William Jennings Bryan to Father Charles Coughlin were courageous enough to speak the truth. May I remind our president with all due respect that not one of these soldiers cast a ballot on that fateful Good Friday night in the spring of 1917 to force a peace-loving nation like ours to take up arms for the profiteers and the exploiters of mankind. And during the Depression, no one was more dangerous to the banking interests than Huey Long. We tried the Republican Party, we tried the Democratic Party, then we've gone back and tried the Republican Party, and now we're back trying the Democratic Party. And unfortunately, whenever we get into power with either one of these parties, we find that the one crying need of our people, the redistribution of wealth, so that none would be too poor and none would be too rich, is always neglected by the party that is in power. How many men ever went to a barbecue and would let one man take off the table what's intended for nine-tenths of the people to eat? The only way you'll ever be able to feed the balance of the people is to make that man come back and bring back some of that grub he ain't got no business. But assassination as a tool of political policy was nothing new to this crowd. President Jackson, for example, in his era, he was the leading opponent of the privately owned central bank. Well, what happened to him was an assassin uh, who was connected to international bankers, it was later found out, got right up to Jackson, stuck two pistols in his belly, fired both at the same time, 
both inspired. Jackson was saved. And interestingly enough, even though history books don't spend much time dwelling on this uh, bank problem, Jackson himself uh, numbered this as his leading accomplishment. In fact, on his tombstone, you know what's on it? It's, I killed the bank. Seven changes the rules. Going back to the American Civil War, Germany's Chancellor Otto von Bismarck declared, the division of the United States was decided by the high financial powers of Europe. They were afraid that the U.S. would upset their financial domination over the world. They saw tremendous booty if they could substitute two feeble democracies burdened with debt to the financiers in place of the vigorous republic sufficient unto herself. Abraham Lincoln realized this and so stood firmly for preservation of the Union. But Lincoln needed money to win. Lots of it. He went to the Wall Street bankers who wanted 36% interest per annum. Honest Abe chose a less expensive alternative, choosing to have Congress issue the money. The bills were called greenbacks, and they weren't backed by gold, only by the full faith and credit of the United States. With Congress issuing the money, not one penny of interest was paid to private bankers. Uh, the assassination uh, of Lincoln was related to the bankers wanting control of the money. Uh, the same thing went for John Kennedy, that he was planning to uh, reintroduce uh, uh, the U.S. notes uh, rather than Federal Reserve notes. And of course we go back to the Constitution of the United States, which provides that the Congress shall coin the money, the currency, and regulate the value thereof. If you go out and ask the average person on the street who issues the money, they'll say, the government issues the money. That that's why the lie works, because people know intuitively that the government should issue the money. Well, the Federal Reserve is neither federal and has doubtful reserves. You will not find the Federal Reserve in the blue pages of government in any phone book. You will find it in the business pages next to Federal Express. Congressman Lewis McFadden fought the Fed to his last breath. He once called it a super state controlled by international bankers and international industrialists acting together to enslave the world for their own pleasure. Two attempts were made on his life, one from a man wielding two pistols, both shots missed, and the second from a poisoning attempt, but fortunately there was a doctor on hand to pump his stomach. Of course, a conspiracy powerful enough to cause both world wars and the Great Depression would have to have a clubhouse somewhere, if only to split up the cash. It turns out they do. If you haven't heard of the Bilderbergers, it's for one reason only. They haven't wanted you to. At their annual closed-door meetings, no outsiders are allowed even close to the building. Here are gathered the most powerful individuals of the Western world united regularly at club meetings. Yet nothing is reported by the New York Times, the Washington Post, or the LA Times. What really fascinates me is the complete blackout in the American press. For more than 20 years, I've gone down to the press club every day. I check the wires in their library, mingle with other paper boys, and I ask them the question many times, why, when if uh, 120 film stars or 120 NFL football players met behind locked and guarded doors in a remote location for three days, you'd try very hard to penetrate and find out what those movie stars or football players are doing. Well, I have no curiosity at all when 120 of the world's most powerful financial leaders and political leaders. Well, I have no curiosity at all when 120 of the world's most powerful financial leaders and political leaders meet for three days in a remote location behind armed guards in a complete blackout. Well, I have no curiosity. Actually, quite a bit of security, but it's discreet. Uh, so what would happen if someone tried to sneak through the trees back there? I don't know. I wouldn't want to try it. What we do hear coming out of those meetings is incredible about the plans of the New World Order to consolidate power. Political power and economic power coming together at the highest level. But the what I call the lapdog media, the controlled media in this country, you would think that they would be going to court, crying freedom of information, open meetings, sunshine law, and all of these things, but the silence is deafening. Attendees at recent Bilderberg meetings have included presidential advisor George Stephanopoulos, Senator Sam Nunn, David Rockefeller, former Senator Lloyd Benson, 
and Henry Kissinger. One month earlier, 50 liberal groups met in Washington to discuss the political satellite of the United States in recent years is really the one pulling the strings of international policy. It's not a matter of who owns the Fed, it's who controls it. The government has given the banks a monopoly, and then you see the Justice Department doing nothing about the bank mergers. A monopoly can only exist with government assistance, and they've given great assistance to the banking monopoly. Perhaps the headiest... If you have the money, uh, you can get any law passed you want. So who do you carry? Whether uh, Bill Clinton is president or uh, uh, who is senator from New Jersey, it doesn't make any difference because you write a check and you get another senator. One of the stickiest questions in this debate is this. Just who owns the Federal Reserve? The city of London set the whole thing up. The Federal Reserve Bank of New York is principally owned by five merchant banks in London chartered by the Bank of England. Perhaps England, which many have considered a allegation made against those who run the Federal Reserve, is that they are responsible for three of the biggest tragedies of the 20th century. World War I, World War II, and the Great Depression. Wars are very profitable. In fact, wars are probably the most profitable thing uh, an international banker can be involved in. So consequently, throughout the last at least 300 years, of North American and European history, you see incidents of uh, international bankers backing both sides of a conflict. They've been trying to have a war in Europe since 1885, but the central banks of Europe had already bankrupted all the nations of Europe. They had no money. The only money was here in the United States. In order to get that money, they had to put a central bank over on the American people. It was sold as a way to bring stability to the American economy. Well, uh, what happens uh, just a little over a decade after the passage of the Fed? We see the biggest depression uh, of this uh, century in any case. For the 16 months prior to the... ...to the activities of the Fed because the banking system has become global. And you could no longer regulate the U.S. money supply by simply uh, via the, the domestic Federal Reserve Bank. The Federal Reserve controls the very heart of what's happening with money because money answers everything. It's the one thing that everybody wants. And when you give a private institution a monopoly on the creation of this money, you vest total control in that institution. 